All right, we can. We're going to go to Hebrews 4, but I'd like to read a verse in Genesis 2 first. This almost probably should have been a sermon, but the Lord laid on the heart to teach. Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. I'm sure we've all heard these words before, but here the Bible says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now I don't plan to preach that we need to or teach that we need to worship on Saturday, so I don't think that's where I'm going with this. But let's go over to Hebrews chapter four. This rest is what I'd like to think about today. God rested the seventh day, which was really a type for us. One that we ought to rest one day a week at least. Mm -hmm. And if my job had it their way, I'd be working today too. But right. man needs rest physically, but man also needs spiritual rest. Amen. And that is the rest we'd like to look at in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's just go ahead and get into verse 1 here. It says, Let us therefore fear. Here he's building on really what he had been talking about in chapter 3. We're kind of mid-thought here. He had been speaking on the unbelieving Jews in the wilderness. How that they, they did not make it to the promised land. In fact, if we go back, the very last verse of the chapter says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy tells us that only Joshua and Caleb entered in. Yeah. Deuteronomy 1, verse 34 through 39 tells us that. And again, it's Numbers 26, verses 63 through 65. Because of all those that were numbered when they came out into Sinai, that only Joshua and Caleb remained. So I know Brother Larry has mentioned, and I, the more I study, the more I think he's right on this. That besides Moses, Joshua and Caleb probably were the only ones truly saved in the whole bunch. Right. Because the rest had unbelief, it says. Yeah. The rest, they, in fact, it says, verse 17, but with whom was he? Greed forty years was it not <clears throat> with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Amen. <laughs> Every last one of them, save Joshua and Caleb, died there. Right. But even that was a type. That was believe, the land of Canaan that they were promised was a type of heaven. Mm -hmm. You see it multiple times used that way in scripture. And that none could enter into that with who had unbelief. And so it is with the heaven of heavens. None can enter in if they are in unbelief. Amen. It says here, let us therefore fear. So these were the, the chosen people of God, Israel, yet even they could not enter in because of unbelief. We know that Israel was God's nation in the Old Testament, that he Bless them. He gave them the oracles of God, it says. He Amen. gave them the sign of circumcision. He had blessed them greatly. Yet even they, in all of this, could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. He says, therefore, fear. That's, we are to fear God. Right. Not that we should run and hide in the corner and be afraid of Him, but we should stand in awe of Him. We should reverence Him. Amen. Amen. Matthew 10, 28 says that fear not them that kill the body, but fear him which after he has killed you, that power is cast in hell, yea, it's in you, fear him. Amen. I think that's Luke 12, actually. And Matthew's gospel, I believe, goes that we should fear him which can destroy both body and soul in hell. But we are to fear God, not man, but 
lest therefore fear is it lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it we see this promise of rest what well, we see it in type back in Genesis 2 we see that literally in Exodus 33 I'll turn there and read that for us if you're familiar with this area of scripture this is right before Moses request to see God face to face he had pitched the, t the tabernacle outside the camp and God came down in the pillar of cloud and talked with him Moses wanted assurance that God would be with them verse 14 of chapter 33 of Exodus God replies to Moses and says he said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest amen and God gives rest to his people right amen. entering into the land of Canaan was the guess their ultimate rest as the nation of Israel they would no longer be wandering in the wilderness right. really entering into Heaven will be our ultimate rest as people of God. No longer wandering in this world. The wilderness really is a type of the world. Mm -hmm. But there is a rest even now for the people of God. There is a rest in the person of Christ, isn't there? Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, coming to me all that heavy laden. <laughs> And I will give you rest, he says. Yeah. We say, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> so there is rest in the person of Christ. Amen. And that's really what the Hebrew writer here, which I believe is Paul, is driving home in these first 11 verses. That there is rest to be found in God or in Christ in particular. But he goes on to say, lest, any of, lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Let me also make mention that we have to remember he is writing to Jews here, so mm -hmm. they have a Jewish mindset. When the Jews think of rest, they're thinking of the Sabbath rest, mm -hmm. which he'll bring out here in a few verses, but... He says, lest any of you should seem to come short of it. Well, he doesn't say any of them will come short of it. Certainly none of God's people can come short of this rest that is in Christ. Amen. But we can sure seem to come short of it, can't we? Yeah. There are a few ways. You know, if we're thinking of the heavenly rest, then we seem to come short of it when we live a life that's unpleasing to God. Or when we indulge in wickedness, we seem to come short of that rest which is in God. Yes. You know, the rest which is in Christ, that is rest from our works. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but that really is the rest that is found in Christ. It's, that we can rest from our works. Amen. Yet we can seem to come short of that rest when we live as if we have to work to be saved or work to keep our salvation. Right. Now, there are many today that believe that works-based salvation is very prominent very popular mm -hmm. and it promotes what man can do but that's the difference between the gospel <coughs> and this modern day works-based gospel mm -hmm. Christ did it all for us and that's why we can rest in him Amen. <clears throat> but even many Baptists even of our type seem to think that they had to work in order to keep themselves saved. They might not say that, but that's how they <coughs> live in practice. Mm -hmm. well, I certainly believe we ought to live godly righteousness over in this present world. It's what Titus teaches us. Yeah, that's not what keeps us saved. Amen. So let us not seem to come short of this rest which is in Christ. He goes on to say in verse 2, 
For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. The gospel was preached to this group here. He said, as well as to those that were in the wilderness. Well, ever since studying the sacrifices, I've tried to look for the gospel for Christ in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So that everything I think you can find the road to Christ. Yes, the Jews of the Old Testament, they had the gospel preaching to them. It wasn't perhaps not the same version, if you will, that we have. It was, but I'm sure they didn't hear Jesus was crucified and buried and rose again the third day. Right. They heard Jesus was coming, that Christ Amen. was coming. Really, it was Christ that must have been sufficient then and just as he must be now. Their works could not save them, as Paul points out over and over again in his Amen. Address. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Really, here is the key to all the gospel preaching, isn't it? <laughs> that must be mixed with faith, as he says here. You know that me and Brother Larry could preach till we're blue in the face. Amen. And yet, a person does not have faith that will essentially do them no good. You're right. Amen. Why do so many come to hear preaching over and over again and go out unchanged because they have no faith? Amen. You know, a whole slew of preachers will do a person no good if they don't have faith. The word preached and not profit them because they not be mixed with faith and then they heard it. Well, I certainly believe God uses preaching. First Corinthians eight or one verse eighteen tells us the preaching of the cross is in the parish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Amen. And in verse twenty one he goes on to say for the foolish, foolish <coughs> through the foolishness of preaching, please God save those which believe. God uses preaching to save the people. Amen. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just a couple of verses previous to that, he says that, How shall they hear without a preacher? So, yes, preaching is important. That doesn't necessarily have to be Brother Larry standing in the pulpit, but simply proclaiming the gospel. Amen. Yep. Yeah. It must be mixed or combined or occupied with faith. There are many today that hear preaching, they go out in the flesh and try to clean up their lives, but they don't have faith. So faith is the key to really make preaching effective, if you will. I won't belabor that point, but real quick, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Verses 6 and 7 say, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 7. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave increase. Amen. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth increase. So some of us plant, some of us water. That's the preaching, that's the teaching, that's the witnessing, but God must give the faith. That's the increase. Amen. It doesn't say that man must give the increase, but God must give the increase. I know, I don't know if Brother Junior, you got a garden this year or not, but you plant it and you water it, you take care of it. But God has to give the increase, doesn't he? Amen. So it is the spiritual fruit as well. Amen. Going on, verse 3 he says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What he says is that we which have believed do enter into rest. Mm -hmm. We have a rest currently as people of God. Amen. That is a rest from works for salvation. It's a rest from works from keeping salvation. And we'll see here 
plan to get to, hopefully. There is a rest which remains for the people of God. Amen. You know, the Jews, they were often trying to go back to the law. And what did Acts 15, what did Peter say there? Shall we lay the yoke upon these that neither our fathers nor you can bear? Amen. No, oh, by grace they shall be saved just as we are, what Peter concludes that thought with. The law could not save, works cannot save. Amen. There's really not any difference between good works based salvation and law keeping salvation. Amen. Based on the same principle. Amen. Oh, really, the whole book of Galatians, the theme is that works do not save us. Right. <laughs> Let's turn and read a couple verses real quick. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. But so this freedom and liberty that we have in Christ that we can rest. <clears throat> Well, if I believed in I had to keep my own salvation by my good works, I'd be worried all the time. Amen. That's why it's a burden. That's why it's not rest. You're always worried about, am I doing the right thing? Am I going to mm. lose my salvation? Am I... mm. It's really a heavy burden to bear to try to keep mm. your own self saved. Amen. Or to even try to work yourself up to be saved. Oh. I think he was well-meaning, but he was our meaning fellow who once said, being saved is the easiest thing you'll ever do. <laughs> Which I get where he's coming from. Christ did it all. Mm-hmm. But it's really not what you do. Really, there's nothing that you can do. That's why we must have this rest in Christ. Turn back to chapter 3, Galatians. I don't know how anyone... Can read the book of Galatians and still believe it works based salvation, but notice verse 2. He says, This only would I learn of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Right. So have you received the Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit because of your works or because of your faith? I think we all know the answer to that it's not by the works. Amen. Verse 3 he says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Yeah. Paul didn't really hold any punches there. He says, are you yeah. that foolish to think that you can begin in the Spirit and get the flesh and make you perfect? And he said, he has begun a good work and he will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. I'm not trying to get off on a rabbit trail, so we'll get back to our text here. He says... As I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Or if they shall enter into my rest. These words are from Psalm 95, verse 11. And there his word is a little different. And he says, I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Speaking to those unbelieving Jews in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Which really goes back to what he was talking about in chapter, third, chapter 3. Uh, because of unbelief, they could not enter in. <laughs> right. Both in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. He says, although the works were finished on the foundation of the world, here they, referring back to what we read in Genesis 2, God finished his works and rested the seventh day. Well, they had the Sabbath rest, but they didn't have the spiritual rest. The Jews were all about their Sabbath rest, weren't they? Mm-hmm. We find in the New Testament they condemned Jesus for plucking corn to eat. Right. They condemned him for healing on the Sabbath day. But that's not the rest that God was speaking of here, or <clears throat> that the writer is speaking of here. Certainly, that was a type. But as he goes on in verse 4, he says, For he Speaking in a certain place on the seventh 
of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So yes, he, God rested the seventh day, and there is a, a rest there for the people of God. But notice it says that God rested from all his works. That is the great type, if you will, that in God we can rest from all our works. Amen. And he goes on in verse 5, In this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So he is talking about a spiritual rest, not the Sabbath rest. He said, having a Jewish audience, that's the rest they were had in mind. Well, we rest on the Sabbath day. But no, there is a rest in Christ, which goes far greater than the Sabbath rest. Amen. Verse 6 says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, they even whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Well, there's still some that he says must enter into this rest. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't stand up here and tell you about Christ. I tell Brother Larry, just go on home, no need to preach anymore. Right. Well, there's still some that must enter into this rest. Those with unbelief, once again, they will not enter into this rest. Amen. Verse 7 says, Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time, it is said, Today you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. This is again going back to Psalm 95, this time in verses 7 and 8, he's quoting from. He says, There's he designated a certain day or a certain time, if you will. So don't harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness, but enter into his rest. Amen. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians 6 2. You know, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Amen. Now is the day of salvation. <laughs> no, certainly today, literally today, is the time to be saved if you're not. Amen. No, in a more figure since we live in today is the time to be saved. But today we'll have an end, won't it? Mm-hmm. One day this age of grace, if you will, will end. That's right. Oh, so be saved today before it's too late. Amen. Enter into this rest while it is today. Mm-hmm. Verse 8, he goes on to say, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So many think that this Jesus is referring to Joshua. They are the same name. Joshua is from the Hebrew and Jesus is from the Greek. Certainly Joshua didn't lead them into Canaan, but that's not the rest that's speaking of, spoken of here. Amen. So it was a type of that rest. It's a type of our ultimate rest in heaven one day. But that was not the rest which people of God were to seek after. There was another day of rest. Amen. Which came through the person of Jesus. The person of our Lord Jesus Christ gives us this rest. He said, if he had given them rest, he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. So that's the day in which Christ came. That's the day in which Christ took our burdens. Amen. But we no longer need to try to work for our salvation. Verse 9 says, here's what I was alluding to earlier, <clears throat> there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Amen. There is a rest currently. <laughs> we didn't just get rest at conversion and then we got we don't have rest anymore. But currently we can rest in Christ. Amen. We didn't take our burdens and give them back to us. You know, that's how we often live. There is a rest. Or there may have therefore a rest of the people of God. There is a rest coming, which we will be able to completely rest from all our old labors. It was found it interesting that this word rest here is different than the rest of the scripture. This is this does come from the word Sabbath. I believe it's a 
The day that is coming in which we will have an endless Sabbath with God, if you will. Amen. Where we will be able to completely rest from our labors and worship God throughout all eternity. That is the ultimate rest for the child of God. All right. Let's sure. say all this to bring it around to that show that even in the Sabbath, it points to Jesus. Really, He is our spiritual Sabbath. In Him, we can rest from our works just as God rested from His. Amen. Let's go ahead and go to verses 10 and 11 and we'll close. For He that has entered into his rest, speaking of God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Amen. Really just kind of driving the same point home here. That if we have God's rest, we can rest from our works. Mm -hmm. We no longer have to strive about to keep or to earn our salvation by works, but we can simply rest in God, just as God rested from his work on the seventh day. Now verse 11 might seem a little contradictory to everything we've been saying here. He says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man <clears throat> fall after the same example of unbelief. You can say, well, how do we labor to get into rest? Mm -hmm. This labor means to be diligent, to be earnest. We have to put forth an effort. It's not saying we had to work ourselves to hope we get rest one day. Right. But we are to make sure we have that rest. We are to be diligent about ensuring that we are not in unbelief. Amen. I know Brother Larry quotes that scripture in Second Peter all the time. Make your calling and election sure. Amen. That's really what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. Let us diligently make sure that we are not in unbelief. Examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says. Amen. So there is a rest in Christ. The world knows nothing of this rest. That's why they strive about to do good deeds and have good works. And that's the problem with a works-based salvation. Though. There's no rest in Christ in it. Right. You depend upon what you can do, or what you will do, what you might not do. But really, Christ did it all. Amen. And that's the great rest for us now that we can just rest in him that he accomplished it for us. Amen. So that doesn't excuse us from serving him. It doesn't excuse us from living a Christian life. As far as salvation goes, whether it's earning it or keeping it, or we can rest from our works. He said one day there, there remains that rest for us that we won't have to contend with sin anymore. We won't have to struggle with trying to live a godly life. We'll have that perfect body. We'll be forever with the Lord. That is that rest which we should long for. That is the fulfillment, if you will, of the rest that we have now in praise. So what he says here, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Let us diligently seek to make sure we have that rest. <laughs> That we are not in unbelief. But he said, unless any man should fall after the same example of unbelief. So just as with the Jews in the wilderness, it is the same day. We, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. You can't enter in to heavenly rest if you're in unbelief. And you can't enter into the current resting Christ if you're in unbelief. Amen. Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. 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 Amen.